Hi folks, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I want to welcome you to the opening lecture for the 2023 Clay Festival. Um, yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. You're in store for a big treat. Uh, I first want to thank a few folks. I want to thank uh, Lee Gruber, who is not here and is the founder of the Clay Festival. We wouldn't be here without her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She is having fun out of the country. You better believe it. And I also want to thank Swinmact and in specifics, Bridget and Aubrey who were a great help to me this year, and um, I was grateful for their support and the entire organization. And of course, I wanna thank Western New Mexico University, in specific, Dr. Shepard, who uh, really threw some support behind the Clay Festival always, but especially this year. So I wanna thank the staff also at Western New Mexico University for supporting us, and especially Dr. Shepard. All right, and um, I'm going to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, George Rodriguez. He was born and raised in El Paso, Texas, and he now lives between Philadelphia and Seattle, making decorative ceramic sculpture that addresses his identity and community. Uh, he was the first in his family to finish college, and he received his BFA in ceramics from the University of Texas, El Paso. Then he went on to receive his MFA from the University of Washington. He was the recipient, the recipient of a Bonderman Travel Fellowship, which allowed him to travel the world through most of 2010. This travel continues to have a profound impact on George and has helped him grow his community. George is a co-organizer of the Color Network, which is an organization that aids in the advancement of people of color in the ceramic arts. The Color Network assists artists develop, network, and create dialogue while maintaining a place for database, resources, and mentorship. He's received several prestigious awards, including the Emerging Artist Honor in 2019 by the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts, and the Patty, we the Patty Warshina Luminary Award, which was granted by the Museum, excuse me, the Museums of Northwest Art in 2017. His work can be found in permanent collections, including the National Mexican Museum of Art in Chicago, the Haley Ford Museum in Salem, Oregon, the Renwick Gallery at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC, and the National Museum in Stockholm, Sweden. He lectures and teaches all over the country and was recently an artist in residence faculty at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture in Philadelphia from 2019 to 2021. So in our midst, we have an incredible educator and maker and innovator. So please give a warm welcome to George Rodriguez. Um, great, thank you, Courtney. <clears throat> thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be back in a region that is, uh, you know, in my blood, that's so familiar to me. I grew up um, just a couple hours from here. So I'm really excited to be back. And um, Courtney, thank you so much for inviting me and everybody involved with the Clay Festival. It's really, you know, it's only day one and it already feels like a really enriching and fulfilling um, workshop here. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my background, um, where I came from, some of my early work, and then some of the work that I'm doing now. <clears throat> and if you have questions, you know, jot those down. I'm happy to answer anything. Um, so. Uh, you know, usually when I'm talking about where I grew up, El Paso seems very uh, foreign, especially when I'm in places like Seattle, Philadelphia. But to hear, you know, this is my area. I um, have a really, really strong support system, and I always like to share my family because I pursued a career in the arts, and that's a difficult thing to do. Um, as Courtney mentioned, I was the first in my family to finish college. Um, and when I went to college and decided that I was going to study art, you know, I needed that support system from my family to really kind of get me through it. Um, so I went to UTEP. <clears throat> I took a ceramics class just kind of out of the blue. I knew that I wanted to do something 
in the arts. Um, so I first studied, um, or I went in to study graphic design. And as part of that program, you had to take introductory ceramics, sculpture, metals, painting, etc. So I took clay first just to kind of get it out of the way. I, didn't, I knew nothing about the material, right? I thought, um, I really thought uh, clay was making uh, pottery, which I wasn't as invested in at that time in my life, or small figurines, because I saw my aunt painting little, like, you know, paint your own pottery figurines. Um, but I, um, you know, the doors were kind of blown wide open. And this is a self-portrait that I made in my intro to ceramics class. Um, and, you know, I always like to thank my mentors. This is Vince Burke, who is still teaching at the university um, in uh, Texas, El Paso. Um, and he really just gave me the opportunities to, uh, the encouragement to just kind of pursue, pursue clay. Um, I work with a lot of self-portraiture, so I made that in my intro class. This was a mold-making class in undergrad. It, um, I was trying to make an articulated figure that was like an action figure. Um, I couldn't get the mechanics down, so I made a series of these 15 uh, self-portraits with molds, um, and step by step, they teach you how to dance uh, Macarena, right? So it's like <laughs> a tutorial for you to learn how to dance. Um, and I was thinking, you know, story, the, the workshop that I'm teaching is called um, Embellish Something? Stories, thank you. <laughs> Embellish Stories. So uh, for me, it's, it's been a lot, you know, I like to storytell with my work. Um, so when I thought about the Macarena, I was like, well, where do I dance this? And it would be at my sister's quinceañera. That's where I was uh, dancing. Uh, I also, um, in undergrad, was doing a lot of painting. So this is me trying to figure out what I'm doing with my life. Am I joining the military? Am I um, becoming an accountant? Am I continuing to sell shoes, which is what I was doing? Uh, all through undergrad. So this is me kind of trying to figure out what my path is. When I decided that ceramics was a path that I wanted to pursue, um, I made this piece titled Ring Around the Rosie. That um, is me playing Ring Around the Rosie with five ceramic artists that I admired. So I didn't know them in person, but I can make them out of clay and make them be my friend, right? <laughs> So the other four people there were uh, Sergei Izipov, Akia Takamori, Lisa Clegg, and Tom Bartel. And this was my uh, like thesis work um, at uh, the university. So I've always been interested in public sculpture, trying to kind of put your work out um, in the world. So this was um, in kind of the central area of UTEP before it's completely transformed these days. Um, but I made 16 figures that um, created this playground um, environment. So I moved to Seattle in 2007 to pursue graduate studies. So once I found out like, okay, ceramics is my path, I've gotten uh, the blessing from my family to keep working in clay, um, I applied to graduate schools and got into the University of Washington. One of, my, one of the main reasons that I went to UW was to study with this gem of a human. So he was one of the ring around the rosy um, people. So I got to meet and study with Akio Takamori. Um, and also at that school was Doug Jack, an amazing figure sculptor. Jamie Walker, who kind of rounded out the instructional trio. Um, and John Taylor, who was an instructional tech, who taught me just as much as the, you know, the faculty did. So when I moved to Seattle is really when I started this idea of like ornamentation and embellishment. So I, you know, grew up in El Paso, pretty dry. Um, and then I moved to Seattle, very wet and lush. So um, I was fascinated by all of the growth that was happening and very visible there. So one of the first works that I made in graduate school was this matador and bull. Um, and the reason that I chose this matador was because the kiln that they had was as tall as I was. So I was like, okay, let me use that, that equipment. Um, so I made this matador. And I wanted to figure out a way to create the embroidery that these beautiful traje de luces, these like uh, suits of light um, is what they're called, had. So for me, in order to mimic embroidery, I decided to kind of try this sprigging technique where I'm applying decoration to the surface. So um, I made the first sprigs to basically mimic um, embroidery. Um, 
I'm a child of the 90s, so I, you know, I grew up with the Chicago Bulls, and I always like to try and incorporate a little humor in my work, so there's a Chicago Bulls emblem on this sculpture. Um, and you get a little bit of sense of the scale of that work. Um, <clears throat> the arms, you know, technically for those of you, this is a clay festival, so I'm assuming some of you have clay knowledge, but um, technically the arms were too heavy to kind of like hold on their own, so they were built separate and then epoxied um, after. Um, and I've always loved exploring my work in uh, both in 2D and three dimensions, so sometimes I'll make the 3D object first and then explore that same idea in 2D, and that's because you can, um, you don't have to worry about gravity or depth or space, um, so you can, you know, explore further. So this is a silk screen I made of that piece. Leaving graduate school <clears throat> through the University of Washington, we had to put together two shows, one at the museum and then one at um, the ceramic building gallery. So this was my museum piece. Um, and I'll go through really quickly just like how I made the work. Um, and this is what we're kind of doing in the workshop. Um, made a lot of slabs, made a lot of sprigs. And at this point I was building um, eight figures all at the same time so that they you know, can kind of fit next to each other. Um, you have to maintain the dryness as you're building. So I'm working on putting all the ornamentation and getting all that detail in as I'm building up. You can see those notches in the arms where those were also built separately and then attached later. I always say that when you build large scale, um, you need to be nice to people. Uh, I mean, you need to be nice to people anyway, but uh, if you're building large, you are asking for a lot of help all the time. So those are my friends Jacob, Foran, and Shelby Stewart, who are graduate students there, who would help me load and move the pieces. <clears throat> Also, if you're working in clay, you have to be okay with uh, failure, right? The clay sometimes does what it needs to do. Uh, sometimes it's an engineering thing, which in this case, it was my fault. I built it too thin trying to save on clay. I was a poor graduate student. Um, and there was no interior support structure, so I built these. We got the first one into, we got the first one close to the kiln. It broke as we were trying to move it. So I was like, okay, seven pieces. Still a band, great. Uh, we got the second one close. We were able to get it up, but then it collapsed under its own weight. And then at that point, I figured six figures, no longer the band that I want. Uh, so I went into my studio, broke all six, and then started from scratch again. Um, this time building three at a time, so it ended up being a band of nine. Because uh, I could build three, move them into the kiln, build the next three, and so forth. This is a work without any glaze on them. Those are the heads that would eventually go inside of uh, the bodies. <clears throat> heads with uh, sombreros and boots. And then that was a, a finished work for my thesis show. So this uh, piece makes a wall that's about 20 feet long. They're about seven feet tall. So this would be the first view that you see when you're approaching the work. Um, you would see the back. Um, by looking at the back, you kind of know that something else is going on on the other side because you can kind of see through the hats, but you don't get a full view. So for me, this was an idea of like community and where I saw myself or where I see people's efforts to engage with community. So you can stand on the back and wonder like what's on the other side and you can live there your whole life, right? Or you can take some time and walk around the edges and you can look from the edges in and get a better view of what's happening or you can go even further and like take a step into that uh, center space, that plaza, and be fully surrounded and embraced. Um, there's more vulnerability in being, you know, and taking those extra steps, but um, I think it's like really uh, worth it. So <clears throat> I talked about my sister's quinceanera. Um, I never had a quinceanera. Uh, <laughs> I wanted a quinceanera. I have, I have four older sisters, right? Um, so. For my other show, I had a quinceanera. I made it myself. Uh, it's called Bella the Ball, and it was my coming out as an artist um, when I was graduating uh, with my MFA. So um, that's me. Uh, I'm actually, I'm just behind the dress because I wouldn't fit inside of it, but uh, it was me trying to kind of like embody that um, feeling. 
So um, I had the most wonderful opportunity to get this travel fellowship right out of grad school. It's called the Bonderman Travel Fellowship. And it gave me the chance um, in 2010 to travel to about 26 countries in the span of 10 and a half months. So it was a non-research-based uh, scholarship. It was just to go to uh, non-westernized parts of the world and experience life. Um, so for me, this was like one of the most, and continues to be one of the most transformative times of my life where I just absorbed uh, different cultures and different people. Um, <clears throat> I came back from that experience really confused, not really knowing what like, I was doing, but I had this landing spot in Seattle at Pottery Northwest. Pottery Northwest was a two-year residency program, and after my two years there of building connections, making community, I wanted to make a sculpture based on you know, how I was feeling, which was kind of exhausted, but still you know, kind of ready to keep, keep moving. So I looked at this uh, piece by James Frazier, End of the Trail, but most, uh, or more like, um, actually I was looking at this piece by Luis Jimenez, uh, which is the first version that I saw, right? So, End of the Trail with Electric Sunset lived in the library at UTEP, so I would visit this piece when I was a student. I wanted to make my own version of the End of the Trail, so I started with these little mock-ups, and I talked to the workshop a little bit about the mock-up stage. So, the first one was me on a horse, second one was me on a toy horse, moved into me on a sawhorse, because I'm a maker and I use a sawhorse a lot to make things, uh, and then switch that to me on a bench. Um, I ended up going with maquette number three with me on a sawhorse, and this is me kind of building that along. And that's what the finished sculpture um, ended up looking like. And I chose with an electric sunrise instead of sunset, <clears throat> just because it felt like a, like a fresh start, right? There was still more potential ahead. Um, and that's what the back of that piece looks like. That's the exact same sprig that I used on the, on the embellishments for the matador, that kind of like embroidery sprig, that's the same one. So I've had you know, a great fortune to be working with Foster White Gallery in Seattle for, since 2010. So um, I was in a group show with them in 2010 while I was traveling, and then they offered me my first solo show in 2011, and I was like freaking out I didn't know what to do, my first commercial gallery. So I kind of reverted back to what I'm comfortable with, which was a self-portrait. Um, and for me, the self-portrait was always kind of a defense mechanism in some way. It was like, I was making my image, so you can't tell me that I'm wrong, right? Like that I'm doing, I'm doing it wrong. Um, so I made this self-portrait, Rodriguez with Flowers, which kind of married um, my image with this embellishment style that I was starting to really love. And then I thought about my tocayos, the other Georges around. Uh, so I started to create all these other Georges off of, my, off of my face, right? So it all started with my image. I made a mold of that and then transformed myself into George Burns and Boy George and Curious George, um, all with different types of embellishments. And the 2D version of that is, <clears throat> if you can see the gold and the silver behind the drawings, that's the silk screen of my face with the drawing superimposed over the top to kind of mimic that same idea of like changing the mold into something different. Usually um, when I work on a, like on a, when I'm making work, I like to think in series or bodies of work, right? So uh, for me, having gallery, rep gallery representation helps because I can put a show together that like looks like a cohesive show. So after the Georges, I was asked like, are you a narcissist? Because all you do is make Georges. Um, so I made uh, the narcissist dress, which is a daffodil, right? If you look inside, there's a mirror, so you can kind of catch your own reflection, which kind of plays on the, fa on, like, the, uh, the mythological story and then um, also on the flower. Um, so all of these are portraits without me using my actual face. So Ari has this flora from... Uh, the Pacific Northwest, which was becoming my home, and on the back, which you can't see, is uh, Southwest, which is my home as well. 
Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I had fun working with all these forms. My mother is a seamstress, so she made dresses for all my sisters um, and for other people. But so I was grew, grew up around this like beautiful form that was, you know, meant to be decorative and ornate. Um, extrovert, you know, as an artist, you kind of have to be, you have to put yourself out there in order to kind of make, make things happen. But sometimes you also, you know, need a little time to recharge. Uh, and I know that that's true for me, so I made the extrovert and introvert dresses, uh, where all the ornamentation is on the interior. Um, and then the 2D version was this of me kind of, you know, figuring out what that was going to look like, me actually wearing uh, some of these dresses on these vase forms. And, you know, you wouldn't necessarily tell that's me unless you see the reference photos uh, beforehand. Um, the next show after that was called um, Here, Hereafter, where I was starting to make, where I was thinking more about community and less about myself, so about these, like, gathering spaces. So I made these uh, small altars, and I was thinking about these roadside altars that uh, we leave for our loved ones and started to make um, different offerings that kind of had that same type of embodiment. <clears throat> so this was really me transitioning uh, out of myself and more into my, uh, my community. Beneath the surface, um, used that same head mold for the George series, but then um, this was the first time that I started to make sense of my travels. This was in 2015 or yeah, I think 15. So five years after I traveled, I could finally make sense of like what had happened and how much I uh, learned. So I started with my face, changed them into these random people, and then build a story uh, around who they were, gave them a name, gave them a, you know, a color scheme, gave them a region that they uh, belonged in. This is also a time when I'm looking at statuary from around the world and trying to make my own versions of that statuary. So like if I took an Olmec head, like what would that look like in my, like under my hands? Um, and that's a couple of heads at, at Foster White Gallery. I'm also looking um, at these connections, these cross-cultural uh, worldly connections. So, you know, this is a lion from Eastern culture, Western culture, uh, and what happens when we kind of merge that together. So this is the start of that piece, the continuation, um, and then the finished uh, object of my version of like an Eastern, Western lion kind of like fusion. Fusion is a good word that uh, people throw around now, so. Um, and this is uh, a, manic, a maneki neko that I uh, built, just to, you can kind of see the process for some of these larger scale works. Um, in 2016, we had a presidential election, right? That was a very divisive election. Uh, so I was trying to figure out like, you know, how can I keep making work um, in the environment that I live in? So I started to make this a series called the Sanctuary Series. Um, and first, I started with the self-portrait, right? That's kind of my, like, what I feel comfortable exploring new ideas. So this is um, State of the Union, my feelings during the 2016 presidential election. Um, so, uh, you know, feeling anger, despair, sadness um, in these um, American colors. <clears throat> I also was looking at these small statuary from Teotihuacan, Mexico, um, which I, like, felt like they embodied a lot of... Um, a lot of emotion within these small stone uh, sculptures. So I made my own version of the Teotihuacan sculptures into my sanctuary um, series. So this is me, uh, this is a self-portrait of the series, We the People, I'm Mexican-American, I grew up on the border, so I'm kind of from both areas, uh, but again, from like, you know, I'm kind of in limbo uh, all the time. So this is me with, the, uh, you know, with my hand over my heart in the stance of the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, but it's just called We the People. There's no signifier into more than that. So then I started to look at my friends and uh, people from my community that were feeling marginalized, uh, communities that I don't belong to, but I was trying to represent in a uh, positive light, right? So I was trying to make sure that I wasn't creating caricatures, but creating these um, statuary that honored uh, folks uh, in my community. So these are a few others um, of, that, of those figures. Each of these are about four feet tall, maybe a little bit taller. Um, and I was invited to show this body of work at my alma mater at UTEP. Um, so because I came back home, 
I made an Uncle Sam and a Tia Katrina as the guardians to the gallery. So, you know, if you grow up on the border, you know that, you know, it's, it's a pretty influential space. Uh, and there's a lot of creativity and community that goes back and forth. So I wanted people to walk through these two pieces that are very different, but very much equal. Uh, and then go into this promenade of figures that um, are very important, right? The placement of the figures for me felt important in the sense that when you walk through like a promenade of statuary like this, it's typically reserved for um, uh, religious clergy or some sort of like stately um, people. So I wanted these folks to have the same type of presentation. Um, and that gives you a sense of scale for the two larger figures. Um, and one of, the, one of the joys of that exhibition was that I actually came back to UTEP um, as an artist, right? Uh, and I got to work with some of the students and it was scary. It was so scary to go back home and like not feel like an imposter, right? Because you go in and you're like, this is a place where I learned that made me. But um, it felt so familiar and so like comforting and I'm so grateful to be able to do that. Um, during that time, <clears throat> around 2016, 2017, I also created an altar for people. And this altar um, was part of a communal uh, firing. So we, um, we fired this piece. We opened up the kiln during uh, the height of the firing. And then people wrote down their wishes, their fears, their hopes on pieces of paper. And then we introduced them to the altar and let them uh, atomize. Um, and, you know, for me, this was important because it just gave people an outlet in kind of a communal, communal space. So this is a piece that eventually uh, was finished off that altar. I had to remake a couple pieces because um, they didn't, you know, some of them cracked more than I wish they would. But the altar is four bottom um, columns that are uh, the four directions or um, elements like earth, wind, fire, water. And that's kind of this foundation. Above that, there's a wolf and a lion, and that is kind of the, our primal nature, right? Our animalistic nature. The dome above that is faith and death, um, so other things that kind of we can add as, for us as humans. And then the crown is us, the people, right? So for me, um, the people are really important because it's this jewel on the top, but it doesn't have the same uh, visual effect if you remove the foundation underneath it, right? So if you take that and lower it down, it kind of gets lost. And I'm so happy that um, that piece was acquired by uh, UTEP for one of their new buildings. Um, and, you know, I grew up going to see Luis Jimenez, and now my work is in a similar uh, space, which it's like, whew. So, um, you know, thank you, thank you. Um, all of that stuff, like the sanctuary, the altar, like all of that's really like emotionally heavy for me. So in order to continue making, I need to like bring some, like a little bit of humor back into my work. So um, that's my partner, Princess Mildred, um, who also goes by Marisol. Um, so she, my partner is a, a clown by trait. So I wanted to make a portrait of her. Uh, so I made uh, the queen, Marisol is a Leo, so I wanted to make a, a lion uh, playing on the king of the jungle, titled it the queen, and you can tell it's her because of the clown nose on the tail, right? Um, so I needed to make the companion self-portrait because I need to include myself somehow, so I made the howling at the moon um, piece, which is a cat-dog kind of dynamic. Um, and I'm not wearing cool socks today, but you can tell it's me by the socks that this piece has on. Um, <clears throat> after that, I, you know, I always reference other work. Like, if I like an artist, I won't steal their work, but I'll be heavily influenced, right? Just like the Olmec heads or other statuary. So I love this work by Ai Weiwei, The Circle of Animals. So I wanted to make my own version of this piece. So I started out by making um, the original 12 animals from the Chinese zodiac in vase form as these kind of like homage to um, these beautiful Chinese uh, um, Ming Dynasty uh, vases, but with the animals incorporated. 
So um, I love the story of the, of the Zodiac, but I wanted to bring it a little bit closer to home, right? So instead of the dragon, I made a Quetzalcoatl. So there's no dragon in like Mexican mythology, but there is a flying serpent with feathers, you know, which is pretty much a dragon. So, um, so I kind of reinterpreted that. Instead of the year of the rat, it would be El Año del Chapulín. So I wanted to kind of incorporate that, um, that animal. And we're currently in the year of the rabbit, which would be uh, El Año del Caco Mixol, uh, which is a kind of a ring-tailed cat. So I took each of the um, correlating Chinese animals and reinterpret them into an animal that is found in and around Mexico. Um, that was first shown with Foster White Gallery at the Seattle Art Fair in 2018. Um, and I like this picture because when I first started in 2011 with Foster White and I made that George show, I was so intimidated by my gallery. Like, you know, you go into the space and it feels like, feels almost one-sided, like I'm down here and they're up here. But in reality, it's a relationship um, and it is about conversation. and. They're helping me as much as I'm helping them. So it's been lovely to like grow my friendship with uh, my gallerists, Fen Huang, uh, Donald, and Courtney there. Um, I always wanted to make a few different versions of the um, Mexican Zodiac. So the first one you saw was at the Seattle Art Fair. This is the second version that was purchased by University of Washington, and it's the Alebrijes version, which is um, those wooden uh, painted animals from, uh, from Oaxaca. The third version is this uh, Zodiaco en Metallico, which is uh, a metallic glaze that I put over the pieces that uh, is in homage to the Ai Weiwei uh, bronzes. The fourth version, still in the works, I haven't kind of gotten the, the, the work down for that one, but the fifth version, which I was really excited that I started during the height of lockdown, was uh, this collaboration with 13 artists that identify as Mexican or Chicane. Um, and each artist was born the year that they, uh, of the animal that they worked on. So Moises Salazar from Chicago worked on the Chapulín, which he titled Grillex. Uh, and he's a queer artist that does a lot of painting, uh, uses glitter, and he wanted to uh, change the idea of masculinity within this piece. Uh, Jose Marreyes, who um, the, did the Quetzalcoatl in the center bottom, he is a spoken word artist from the Bay Area, from San Jose. So this piece, he didn't make any of the physical object, but there's an audio in it of his grandmother reciting this poem that comes out of the mouth of uh, Quetzalcoatl. The, um, the Caco Mixol, which has a little cactus on the ears, that's by a potter in Tucson named Samira Steinmeier, uh, who hadn't worked this large before, but for her, I made a mold shipped her a mold, and she made the entire work herself, right? So each collaboration was completely different. Every artist had their own spin, and it really was about getting to know each other and figuring out. Uh, we had this rubric, but each artist put their own personality into the work. Um, Gabriela Ramirez Mitchell, who made the, um, the monkey, La Peyotera, she was the only artist living uh, in Mexico, so I shipped that piece to Jalisco. She did all the intricate um, string work, and then I was very surprised and excited when I got to open that back up. Um, another uh, body of work, so my, my practice is starting to shift more into like community-based work. I love, you know, I love the workshop because I get to meet so many new people. I love traveling because of that same reason. I made this body of work um, in Seattle with the help of Mad Art, um, Clay Art Center in Tacoma, Washington, and Much, Much Shark Studios in Portland, Oregon. And what I did was invite people to my studio in Seattle to make tiles. That was basically it. Like, I taught them how to make tiles. We made tiles together. We had talks. We ended up making about 6,000 tiles. Um, we all painted tiles together as well. So we spent half of the um, time together making, half of the time painting. That's Liz Wiegand, who I've worked with for about seven years now. And she's helped me uh, through a lot of these um, shows and processes. Gustavo Martinez, who was part of the uh, Zodiac series, he made the goat, La Cabra. Um, he helped me build these rooms. And what we ended up doing was making this, this space called Reflect and Gather. 
which was uh, a plaza, a little gathering space, where you can come by with your community and gather, have conversations, talk to each other, sit down, uh, really kind of enjoy each other's company. And you know, like once we do that, we also need time to reflect on those conversations. So I made these rooms that were completely decorated on the inside, floor, walls, ceilings, so you can step into one of these gathering sp into one of these reflection spaces and just be alone with your own thoughts. So these are some of those spaces um, with different different types of tile. <clears throat> And then the third room was this, um, another type of communal space where you could walk in. The room was pretty much like smooth, wet clay, wet clay on the floor, and you could walk in and leave your mark, right? And it was there for about a month. Every day we would have to go in and water the space to keep it moist. But over the course of that month, you could see that it became more and more alive. More people went in, they left their mark, uh, and so forth. So it really got activated by uh, the people attending. Um, since then, I've used those tiles for a lot of different, you know, that was a temporary exhibition, so I've been able to hold on to some of those tiles. This is a piece called Mexican American Gothic, um, which is on, now with the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian, so it's currently on view. If you go to DC, check it out. Um, but I use the tiles as a background, um, this kind of like abstracted um, sunrise <clears throat> with these two figures that are, you know, Grant Wood's um, iconic American Gothic uh, figures. I moved, to Seattle, I moved to Philadelphia four years ago to uh, be the artist in resident um, at the Tyler School of Art. So I moved into a new urban environment and I was thinking like, well, what am I making? So I made a giant rat and a giant pigeon. Very, very urban. Um, and you know, that's also around the time when I was making these um, these sculptures that were headless uh, bodies and uh, you know bodiless heads, I guess. Now, and this is a work that's actually at the um, Light Art Space Gallery, so hopefully you'll get a chance to go and see that in person. <clears throat> but for me, it was this idea of, um, you know, I know what I like, uh, but what I like might not be what you like, right? So I wanted to give people the um, option to create their own guardian. So by changing these heads, so you know, the chola head could fit on the blue rat, or the calavera head could fit on the red pigeon. And all of these heads are interchangeable within these spaces, they just kind of rest. You know. On Monday I might feel like the primary, and on Tuesday I might feel like a luchador. Who knows, right? So you can kind of uh, make it more playful and kind of create your own, your own space. Um, during the height of um, the COVID lockdown, <clears throat> I made this work at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. So we couldn't gather at all, like this wouldn't happen. Everybody was wearing masks and spaces were limited to like one or two visitors at a time. So I made an altar for Dia de Muertos um, titled La Flor del Nicho y Sus Memorias, where people could come through and leave an offering, right? So I installed these tiles to fully envelop this small little nook um, with these nichos, these little nooks inside that uh, smaller nook. Um, and then I left all these little calaveras and balls of clay where people could come through, build an ofrenda, a little offering with the calavera and leave it behind. So the same way that that wet clay room was activated by people, this altar was also activated by people. And the beautiful part was that, you know, even though you were the only person in there, most of the time, you knew that other people had been there because they left their mark, they left their, uh, you know, their trails behind. Um, and you know, by the end of that month, that whole, on the figure, it was just covered with little funky, funky dudes. Um, I've worked um, since then with this organization in Baltimore called Casa Baltimore and Baltimore Clayworks. And I went into the community there Casa Baltimore is a migrant rights organization, so they um, help people with job placements, um, getting citizenship, et cetera. Um, so I went to the community and I taught some small, like, short uh, workshops, taught people about clay, and then I made three mock-ups of what a public sculpture could possibly look like in their community. So I made these three little mock-ups and then had all the people within a month vote on which one they wanted to see come to life. They voted on that center one, and then I went to my studio and started building that piece. You can kind of see it uh, in progress there. 
Um, that photo is a weird photo, but it shows the interior structure of the, of the form, so you can see how they kind of like don't fall apart these days, um, hopefully. Uh, and then everything gets painted by hand. And I do have people that help me uh, paint as well. Um, and then it was installed at Casa Baltimore. The tiles on the pedestal were all painted by the community, so that was part of uh, the piece. But that was unveiled. Um, and you know, like people were invested in the whole process, so hopefully the piece, because um, clay, it's hard to have clay outside, but the community takes care of it because it's theirs. Um, uh, one of the last pieces that I'll show is um, this Let the Music Take You. <clears throat> I was very fortunate. I've always wanted to move into public art. I got this, there was an open call at, um, for this new um, airport in Kansas City. And I applied to this call, got an interview, um, got accepted. So I started to work on this uh, new band. So not a mariachi, but a jazz band, because it's Kansas City, right? Um, so this is the mock-up for the uh, Let the Music Take You jazz band. And then that's the building of the work within my small studio at, uh, in Philadelphia. You can, if I go back, you can see um, on the figures on the um, left there, you can see a little bit of drywall and that's where the pieces are separated. Um, so they're built um, in sections. The, that's the work in the kiln pre and post uh, firing. So, you know, I leave a lot of the clay body uh, for the skin tones without any glaze so that they just kind of have that natural, more matte look. Um, and then that's the finished band um, all together, right? So they're about, um, about nine feet tall, um, or about eight feet tall, uh, and they span a 30 foot uh, length. So I loaded up a 26 foot truck with these in Philadelphia, drove to Kansas City, uh, dropped them off in a warehouse, and then just earlier this February, these two fine gentlemen helped me install them in place. And you can see that there's still support underneath uh, to help stabilize earthquake proof, et cetera. Like this is all stuff I had to learn. Um, and then that's what the finished piece looks like um, installed. So I'm really happy because this is like, it's a public sculpture. Like I'm kind of inching my way, my way there, right? It's for people to ignore as they're getting on their flight or to people to enjoy as they need a time to like, you know, go through their luggage or whatever. Um, and the pieces have, um, uh, the figures have all of their instruments in cases because it's an airport. So they're either leaving or coming back to their city, right? On the trombone case, which you can't really see, is um, the title plaque that says, um, let the music take you. And I worked with a muralist in Kansas City, and he designed that uh, plaque that we placed on the piece. So I try and like, you know, the person who manufactured the steel and worked on the wooden plinth, they were all local from Kansas City. So I really like, you know, getting to know that community. Uh, and now I have friends that I know I can go back to visit. Um, and then uh, most recently, this piece, um, Seven Indulgences, <clears throat> is part of a big collection of American works that the National Museum in Stockholm just acquired. So now my work's starting to kind of move out of this country, which again, like I feel so, so good about. And that's Princess Mildred slash Marisol. Um, so Courtney mentioned the Color Network, and the Color Network, I've uh, worked with them for a couple of years now, but I've just started as a co-organizer this, um, this February as well. And it's a really wonderful organization that just you know, helps people navigate um, becoming a ceramic artist. So uh, that's Vivian uh, Cisneros, who, uh, Siquero, sorry, who um, was my first mentee. So we were paired up, she lives in Sacramento, um, I live in Philadelphia, but through Zoom, we were able to just talk to each other. And, you know, whatever questions Viv had, I was able to help. Um, I was able to help them, like, apply to grad school or whatever other things that they needed. And then they gave me a lot of knowledge just with their uh, life workings in Peace Corps and AmeriCorps and so forth. So it's a really lovely community. Um, and we provide um, funding opportunities, uh, mentorship, and other things like that. And that was the last slide. Thank you.
It always feels like a marathon. Just like. <laughs> so um, we do have time for a few questions. Does anybody have any questions? My question is how you saw the pictures of the wood in between the, the pieces, but how do you calculate and, and join, you know, like form and then either glue or not glue the body parts and then the head? Are you talking about the Kansas City pieces where you can see that? Yeah. So, you know, like the, with the large scale pieces that are built in sections, even though they're built in sections, um, I still kind of, I form them all together so that the fit is somewhat, you know, true. Uh, and even though I had to disassemble to go in a kiln, it keeps like pretty, pretty well. Um, there is some epoxy in those pieces, you know, if I need to fill or just to secure anything. For the steel work, all of that comes after the final firing. So I always do the clay work first, and then I make um, the wood or steel work to match, because that's, you know, that's easier to do. Um, yeah, there was one problem where two of the shoes, the shoes underneath the jazz band are mostly decorative, right? I like to raise them up so that they don't feel heavy, um, but the steel is really holding everything together. Um, so the shoes slip underneath, and then those get secured so that they can't go away. Um, but there was one fault where two of the shoes were uh, too wide and they didn't fit under the measurement. So then I just remade two shoes because that was easier than doing the whole steel, right? <laughs> so. um, George doesn't look like he's showing up as much in the later pieces. Is that reflective of um, getting over the imposter syndrome? That's a great question. Yeah, I think so. Like, I feel way more confident um, as an artist. I feel like I, um, you know, I feel confident in myself. So um, I still, I still, George still shows up every now and then, but not for everything. <laughs> like, I also, you know, part of the Color Network and I'll, I'll, the parts that I, um, the reason that I love teaching is because now I feel like I have knowledge that I can share, that I can confidently share with people. So in that sense, I'd rather like, you know, show my community because um, I'm, doing, I'm doing pretty good. Like I have no complaints with my, my life. Like, so, yeah. Does anybody else have a question? I was noticing that the larger of your work seemed to be like getting larger. I wondered if you had any dreams of making something like really huge at some point. Um, yes, of course. Uh, yeah, always, you know, it's the, and the larger is just like, it's exciting for me to build that, like, to figure out how to build that work, right? It's, um, I have to figure out how to move it, how to engineer, like, the, the structure of it, how to get it fired. So I, um, yeah, if I can build something larger, um, I would. Uh, I keep talking to all these institutions that uh, have that equipment that allows me to build larger, and I nudge them to invite me to um, do a residency, uh, which I'll be doing. I'll be doing some next year. So um, I'm not sure what the work will look like yet, but um, yeah, I have fun with scale with those jazz bands because that's pretty fresh in my mind. It took about um, the whole commission was about 18 months. It took about um, seven months to build the figures or so. Um, and you know the first one was intimidating. It's like I built that first one, and it was like I was sweating the whole time. By the ninth one, I was like, it felt, it just felt not simple, but it felt very comfortable to build that scale. I am building a large head, and talking my friends through like carrying it, and it was no big deal at that point. So, um, yeah, I want to try some other, some other large scale work. Yeah, so the question was, what kind of clay am I using and what cone? So we're using Akio Takamori, like I'm using Akio Takamori's uh, Cone 6 stoneware, and it's very groggy, very sandy. Um, and I fired a Cone 6 or 7. That clay can go to Cone 10, uh, but it's pretty, pretty strong clay, clay body, very forgiving. So I don't have to worry too much about um, managing the dryness of that clay. Yeah, 
Yeah, so the question was um, about the glazing and all the color. So I um, mostly use commercial underglazes for all of that. And if you look at you know, these two uh, pieces, um, this is pretty muted, but um, on the body of the, of the figure, or let's say on the apron, there's three colors and it's all commercial underglaze. And what doesn't come across very well in this photograph is that there are little bits of gloss like in the center of those flowers, just so that it can catch light from a distance. Um, I don't like glossy like all over, but a little bit of gloss so that you can kind of like, it's like a little beacon, right? It draws your attention. We like shiny things. Uh, so, yeah. There was a question back there. Have you ever tried building your own kill around any of your pieces or? Um, I have not, you know, we did, we built that one kiln um, around the altar piece that opened up and that was in collaboration with Zach Kalinske and Chase Lilleholm who were working at Pottery Northwest at that time. So they did all the building of that kiln and I just made this, the clay, the clay thing, right? Um, I don't want to build my own kiln. Yeah, I, I want to stick to the clay. Like, uh, I want somebody to build me a kiln. <laughs> Any other questions in the center? Yeah, um, the question was, um, can everybody, no. The question was, um, do I have any advice for teachers um, to help assist students to find that inspiration to put content into their work? Um, and, you know, I would say, like, if you're an educator, um, listen to your students. They already know. Like, they know what they want to do, but sometimes they can't verbalize it. So just ask them questions and, you know, Sometimes I approach students and popular culture is really like vibrant in how we live now. So their first instinct, sometimes uh, their first instinct could be like to make a character that they really love because they feel connected to that character. But if you keep asking questions, you find out like what they're connected to and then they can start to create their own uh, stories based off of that. Um, and you know, like I'm a narrative, um, I'm an object maker and I'm a narrative artist, um, so I'm really drawn to that. And there's some people that just like, like formal, that have formal aesthetics. And if that's, you know, you kind of have to listen to people, pay attention and figure out like, are you more interested in like the formal qualities of an object for just the formal qualities or are you interested in the process and how can you, um, how can you uh, amplify what you're interested in, so. Did somebody else have a question down here? So coming from El Paso to Seattle and then Philly, did your sense of color and your eye change on the colors that you were selecting when you live in different places? Yeah, I think my sensibilities change like depending on my surroundings, right? So like, um, yeah, I don't know how, but I know that my surroundings have an influence on, on my work. So I'm looking, you know, the work in Seattle was, uh, even though Seattle's very gray, um, it's actually very colorful. I, I never noticed like how many shades of green, I didn't know how many shades of green there were until I moved there, it's like, wow. Uh, so it really influenced my work that way. Um, but now um, what I like to do is, you know, as part of the storytelling of my work, if I'm making a piece that has a cultural reference, I'll do a lot of reading on that culture, what color um, that culture is using, what they're known for, and then try and, um, try and utilize that. You know, there's a thing about being, I, I utilize a lot of cultures that are outside of my knowledge, so I try and learn as much as I can so that I'm not uh, stereotyping or, um, you know, so that I'm being respectful with whatever it is I'm using, but I think that, you know, we are, we as people are allowed to, you know, if I love um, an Indian, like Hanuman sculpture, which is this kind of monkey god, if I really am gravitated towards that narrative, um, I should be able to learn about it, utilize it respectfully, but then like create a version of that story that rings true to me as well. So. Don't 
<laughs> you need this one. Um, when you have an idea, how do you uh, move it from the beginning to completion, uh, especially if it's a piece that seems especially new or daunting? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I just kind of go for it. Like it's kind, it's hard, it's hard to say, but you know, I am very impatient. Um, I build quick, and it's because I have too many things that I want to do. So. Um, if I have a new idea, I'll, I'll, sketch, I'll sketch first, and if it stays, if it sticks, then um, I'll, just build, I'll just build it. And the first one's usually like, not that great, uh, but then I'll just re, like, I'll learn from that and then re, remake it. Uh, for something like, you know, I keep going back to the jazz band, but for something like that, I really researched and proposed it, so I knew all of the, um, you know, I knew everything that I was going to incorporate on that piece. I didn't talk about this, but each figure had some sort of, um, had the sprigging and the decorative, of, uh, decoration of uh, some Kansas City, um, like iconic space or um, cultural reference to Kansas City. So like one figure had barbecue on it. Uh, you couldn't see, like, there's no, there's racks of ribs all over, but it's stylized in a way that it creates a pattern, right? Or one figure had the Negro Leagues Museum, so there's these little baseball diamonds that are repeated, so they don't look like baseball diamonds unless you really know what they are, right? So for me, something like that, I have done a lot of research, I've done a lot of sketches, um, and then I can just start. Uh, and again, because I'm impatient, I just wanna, I wanna see it in, I want to see it in real life, so. Um. Thanks a lot, that was really cool. Um, I wanted to go back, way back to when you were traveling around the world, and I was wondering, did you, did you go to places that were specifically for clay, or did you just kind of randomly travel? Yeah, so when I, uh, with that travel grant, I had to write a, a proposal, right? And I had to um, create a budget. But the proposal was just things that I wanted to experience. So one of the places I went to was Japan. Um, and for me, um, going to the University of Washington, they have this, um, what's called the quad, which is these 100-year-old cherry blossom trees that are just beautiful. And every spring, it's just like magnificent cherry blossoms that line this quad where thousands of people go to like, get their selfies and photographs and wedding photos and everything. It's just amazing. Um, and I had heard that in Japan there were mountains full of cherry blossoms. So that was part of my proposal, right? Like I want to experience uh, like being surrounded by this type of tree. Um, I want to go see pre-Columbian pottery in uh, Peru, for instance. So that was part of my proposal. Um, so <clears throat> initially when I started, I was trying to network and meet other artists um, along the way. And then as I kept traveling, it just became about like experiencing the place that I was at and kind of going, going with the flow, so. All right. Um, because of the, the size, the size of your pieces, um, uh, you seem to be, well, I wonder, are, are you tied to a particular place that has a kiln large enough for you to work? Um, a little bit, but not, not really. You know, I, in my studio, I do have a large like, car kiln, but it's like a four foot um, max on that uh, height wise, right? So I made Uncle Sam and Tia Katrina in that kiln, but it's in three pieces and then it assembles together. I made the altar um, in that uh, kiln and that's seven pieces that all kind of assemble together. So, um, you know, I like when I can build a large piece in one go that also makes it harder to move and transport and uh, maneuver. But um, yeah, I feel like I can build in sections and then kind of work, work around that a little bit. Um, the harder question is like, where does all this work go? Especially large scale work, right? Like, what, what do you do with it? Uh, I do have one storage, but some of it gets destroyed. Uh, the end of the trail with the electric sunrise, I moved that thing around for probably three, three years before I accidentally broke a section, and it was kind of this release, like, oh, I can let you go. And then I was able to like break the rest of it. I have some photos, you know, kind of like 
ran its course, lived its life. Um, but you don't have to keep everything you make. Like, some of it is meant to, you know, leave. And you have the memory and you have the skills, uh, but you don't have to keep it all. So, the bell of the ball dress, I built that in the gallery space. It was too big to get out of the gallery, right? Too wide to, like, get out of the door. So, um, that served its four-day show, and then it was destroyed, you know? And that's, that was, uh, that's all it needed to be. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Hey. I just want to thank you for being true to yourself and your heritage no matter where you live and for like representing our gente and mentoring and being um, culturally sensitive and not appropriating but like interpreting it and being able to like filter it through your mind and let it um, be reborn and have a life. And um, I know that there's like a ton of like admin work behind organizing shows and events and applying for public art. And I think that um, all your work is obviously beautiful, but I know that there's a lot of hard work behind it. And I just wish you all the success that comes your way. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, that's a great note to end the lecture on. Thank you. And George, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture this evening. We appreciate it. Thank you all.